All right, in tried and true condition, we're about five minutes late. I don't want to break uh, a routine of any. So uh, I will call the meeting of the, uh, the regular meeting of Thursday, September 1 of the City Council Library Board Housing Authority Board and the City Council representing the redevelopment successor agencies, agency. And with that, uh, I would like to call on Jason Hadage to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. May we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Hobart? Here. Councilmember Kite? Here. Councilmember Smotrich? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Townsend? Here. And Mayor Weil? Here. The uh, first presentation will be regarding a ballot measure presented by the Palm Springs Unified School District. And I'd like to introduce Sandra Lyon, Lyon Superintendent, Brian Murray, Murray Assistant Superintendent and Sherry Stewart, sadly retiring uh, board president. So if you would please come to the podium. And Good it is with sadness, by the way. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Weil, council members, city manager, city attorney, and staff. It's, it's my pleasure to be here today in front of you. Thank you for having us. We really appreciate it. My easy job is just to introduce the two people from our school district. First, it gives me great pleasure and it's an honor for me to introduce our new superintendent of schools, Mrs. Sandy Lyon. And I'm sure... I'm sure you're, we will get together with our two-by-twos, and we're going to have a really great working relationship. Sandy brings a wealth of knowledge with her and experience, and like I said before, the school district feels really fortunate to have Sandy as our new superintendent. And second of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Brian, I forgot your last name all of a sudden, <laughs> Brian Murray, who is our assistant superintendent of business. And Brian is going to make the presentation to you today. So I'm going to turn uh, the presentation over to Brian right now. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, Mayor Weil, council members and staff, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to speak to you today about Measure I. So we'll go ahead and, and start the presentation. Uh, I want to just give some background information first. So if you, if you look at the slide that, that is up there now, you can see that the voters of our district have overall been very, very supportive of the school system, Palm Springs Unified School District, that represents a significant portion of Rancho Mirage and uh, Palm Springs in the western Coachella Valley. So with respect to our bond elections over the last few years, you can see that from 92 all the way up through 2008, we've had bond measures that have been presented to the public which have passed. So even going back as far as 92, a $70,000 or 70 million rather bond measure passed uh, significantly and we have spent all of the money there. Uh, 2000, we had a, a 72 million passed at 72.9% and again, we've used the money there. Uh, I'll talk more about how we've used the money uh, as I go forward. 2004, 122 million bond measure uh, passed at 72.7 percent, and again, we've we've extinguished all of that money. And then in 2008, uh, you can see that it was a 516 million dollar measure, and that passed at a rate of 61.8 percent. A big change happened between 2000 and, and 2008. In 2000, the the citizens of California passed Prop 39, and Prop 39 lowered the, uh, the required yes votes to pass a school bond measure from two-thirds to 55 percent. So you can see, even though uh, it was at 61.8 percent in 2008, while it wouldn't have passed pre-Prop 39, it did pass. So we were very fortunate to be able to um, use 
part of that $516 million to do a lot of infrastructure work. So what we did is uh, we built two elementary schools and a middle school in Desert Hot Springs. And as, as I think you all know, here just a few years back, we were able to use that money and build Ranch Mirage High School. So we've been able to, to really put good use of that, uh, those bond funds to work. And so uh, we're at a point right now, though, where we're, we're stuck. And the way the bond system works is that in order for us to draw down bonds and use those bond funds to pay for in infrastructure kinds of, of um, uh, related things, uh, the property values have to consistently increase year to year for us to be able to borrow money against those. Or not borrow, but draw down bond funds against those. So we're at a point right now where we've spent 300 million of the 516 million. And so we're at a point where we have $216 million of authorized bonds remaining that we can't touch because we've reached the limit of which we can draw because of the assessed valuations of, of the uh, property in, in uh, uh, well, the property in, in our district. So that brings us to a, kind of a fork in the road. So what we could do is we could borrow against that $216 million dollars in, in the way of uh, capital appreciation bonds, which are uh, very high interest bonds, but would allow us the capital to be able to do some more infrastructure work. And I'll get to the, again, in just a few slides, what we're talking about. Or we can take it back to the voters for a reauthorization. And so what the reauthorization measure I allows us to do is with, again, 55% voter approval, it allows us to be able to access that 216 million uh, for infrastructure work. So if we take a look at the, the next slide, you can see um, if the reauthorization didn't pass, you can see in, in the first graph on the left, we've, and we needed the funds again to uh, work uh, on creating uh, more improved schools, greater infrastructure, new schools, land for new schools what we would do would be borrow against that remaining authorization in the way of capital appreciation bonds. And, and as I said before, those are high interest bonds. It's much like uh, a loan on a home uh, that has a very high interest rate. While you have the money now, in the long term, you have to pay a significant amount of, of tax on that. So if you take a look at the pie graph on the right, you can see there's that 216 million, uh, 460,000 in blue, and then the interest that would be associated, oops, the interest that would be associated with the, uh, the capital appreciation bonds you can see is well over $300 million. Um, and again, if, if our Board of Education, Sherry of course included, would have said, oh, we, let's just do the cabs and let's not worry about the reauthorization, then what that would have resulted in obviously is a much greater tax burden on our taxpayers. And, and we've been very good in our district not to have to borrow money for capital improvement work. And so with the direction of the board this summer, they said, no, let's, tr let's try to get a, a, a reauthorization so we're able to have the voters weigh in on whether or not we can, we can tap into that 216 million. So you can see if we were to go the cab route, it would uh, significantly increase costs, so especially with respect to interest. If we were to go the reauthorization route, and let's just say in step one, the voters approve the bond re uh, reauthorization. Again, we've already issued about 300 million in bonds, and that 216, 460 would be placed back on the ballot. What we would do is we would, the board would decertify the 216, 460, and not until, and, and once that happens, we would reauthorize the 216, 460. So you could see it would be a net zero increase in debt. And so what that means, however, as you can see, is all of those uh, payments uh, in the out years that were in the previous slide in, in gold are then moved to the current years uh, up through uh, 20, 30, 31 in that area. So, so what that does is it shifts the repayment of the bonds moving forward. So um, the most telling part of this, however, is, is the savings in the long term in the absence of cabs. Oops. You can see the taxpayer savings in the absence of cabs is over $300 million. So while the costs 
up front are greater. You can see that in the long term, we're saving the taxpayers a tremendous amount of money in interest, and the interest actually is a, about a little over $33 million. And, and again, the project fund, the principal of 216, 460 stays. So uh, again, we're kind of in a, 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 a situation where uh, what we're trying to do with these funds, of course, is again to fix deteriorating roofs, leaky plumbing, repairing or replacing classroom heating and air conditioning systems. And as you know, being out in the desert, um, the, the air conditioning certainly gets its use and uh, we are always repairing air conditioning systems and, and uh, are in a routine of trying to get in front of that and replace them before they're broken and, and maximize the use of the funds there. Uh, also replacing old portable classrooms with permanent classrooms, improving handicapped access, of course, and then also upgrading fire and uh, uh, security systems. So, so these are the major uh, uh, projects that we have intended with respect to um, this reauthorization. If we look at how Measure I protects taxpayers, uh, again, what this does is it allows us to access eligible matching funds from the state, also requires us to do independent audits from uh, independent so citizens' oversight. Uh, it does not allow us, of course, to use funds for salaries, pensions, benefits, or anything like that. Uh, all bond funds that we have and we've used in our district are always used for capital projects. Imposing legal, legal safeguards requiring all monies are spent on schools. And it also prohibits the state from taking our funds and, and spending them in outside of the district. So in last summary, I guess you could say, uh, what the good news and the important news is that Measure I, it doesn't increase the overall debt that was authorized back in 2008. That 516 million, uh, of which we've spent 300 million, and the 216 that remains is, it will, will be spent. It will either be spent sooner or, or later, uh, but it, it will be spent. And again, what we're hoping to do is with the reauthorization, be able to use that money now. <coughs> yes, what it would do, would in, it would increase the amount that, that taxpayers would pay up front, but it would not increase the total tax burden to the taxpayer in the long run. So uh, again, uh, that's, that's Measure I, and that's on the ballot for, for um, November. Appreciate that. Any questions? Well, thank you very much. It, it really is an issue of whether you pay it now or pay it later. That's right. And that's what it amounts to. Exactly. And uh, we thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Yes. Question. Uh, is any of the money going for new schools? Yes, actually. Um, there will probably be uh, new schools. We'd have to purchase land first for new schools, but there will probably be new schools. We're looking right now at, uh, as I think council knows, we're looking at a, a K-8 middle school in Ranch Mirage near Ranch Mirage High School. I'm sure some of these funds would be used for that. Uh, also in Desert Hot Springs, uh, that is where the growth is projected to be the greatest in our district. So we'll probably end up with another middle school in Desert Hot Springs or our elementary school as a result of this. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Brian. All right, thank you. And again, uh, Ms. Lyon, we welcome you as the new superintendent. And uh, you know, I'm just giving you a warm welcome and thank you. Uh, uh, the school district is very important to us and we're very proud of the, the facilities you know, in our area. So thank you very much. The next presentation is by Dan Talbot, division chief uh, of Cal Fire. And he's talking about the ST elevation microcardial infraction stem. Uh, and if you would, now that I have tried to pronounce it correctly, uh, I'll leave it up to you, Dan. Okay. Uh, Mayor and Council, it is again um, my pleasure to uh, present information about uh, your firefighters to you. Specifically, I'm talking about myocardial infarction, which is the fancy medical term for a heart attack. So what a heart attack is, is when the blood supply to your heart, your coronary arteries are blocked, the tissue after that blockage begins to die. And when that tissue begins to die, it creates changes in your electrocardiogram that the paramedics um, can see and then begin to start treating appropriately. 30 years ago when I was a paramedic and we didn't have the tools that we do now to actually determine whether a patient was having a myocardial infarction or a heart attack in front of us. 
And if we suspected it, there really wasn't much we could do for them. We would give them some pain med medicines to manage their, their pain and anxiety. We'd give them some medicines to dilate their coronary arteries in the hopes that that block would move further down and potentially kill less heart muscle. But unfortunately, there really wasn't much that we could do or what they could do at the hospital but sit and wait. And because of that, the mortality for those patients was high. And additionally, the patients had an extreme um, decrease in their quality of life because that heart muscle was dead. But fortunately, in the interim, uh, physicians have developed a number of significant treatments between uh, clot-busting drugs, stents, angioplasty that has helped reduce mortality and morbidity. But all of that starts and can start, and the successful treatment of those patients begins when our paramedics in the field recognize that the patient is having a heart attack. And so specifically what we're going to talk about is ST. The ST stands for a per certain segment of your electrocardiogram, elevated myocardial infarction. So what we're looking at here is if you look at the diagram, that is a normal uh, EKG printout. But when heart muscle starts to die, specifically that section that's known as the ST segment right there, begins to elevate in certain cardiac leads. <clears throat> specifically, we use a 12-lead EKG, which is exactly the same lead that uh, same type of EKG that they use in the hospital. And what that means is that through those different electrodes, we can view the heart and the electrical conductivity through the heart from 12 different perspectives. And when we start to see that ST elevation, it's telling us that that patient right then and there is actively having a heart attack. And our goal at that point in time is to alert the hospital and get the patient to the hospital where the physicians can get them into the cardiac care lab and remove that clot or open that artery. So when our paramedics see that and recognize that, a whole chain of communication starts. It goes from the heart monitor to our cell phone. They, they match up uh, seamlessly through Bluetooth all the way to the, uh, the nurse's station at Eisenhower, and the physician can then get um, uh, on the radio and, or on the phone and talk to our paramedics and discuss the appropriate treatment, not only in the field, and we perform many of the same tasks that they would initially do at the hospital in the field, most importantly, one of the things that we do is we draw blood so that when we walk in the door, we can hand the lab technician and they go straight to the lab to do more definitive diagnosis on whether the patient is having a heart attack or not. So that information, again, passes through the MICN all the way down this chart. But the most important part of that is when the paramedic recognizes that the patient is having a heart attack, they speak to the physician in the emergency room and the cardiologist, and they do what's called, we call the STEMI which that means that during the normal nine to five day that if um, they will finish up a patient, they will bump the next patient in the cardiac cath lab so our emergency patient can come in. Or if it's at night, it means that they call the physicians at home and the rest of the cath lab staff back into the hospital. And they do that on our paramedic say so. And there's a great deal of trust between <laughs> us and Eisenhower. We mutually train, we work together. There's constant continued quality assurance to make sure that we're providing the highest level of care possible. There's a picture of the nurse's station and the EKG showing up there. But here's the thing that I'm most proud of. What, what we're looking at is um, the national door to balloon time. That's the time that they hit the ER doors to the time that they actually have uh, instruments in the heart correcting the problem is 90 minutes. But because of the additional training that we do with Eisenhower and the trust that they place on our paramedic, our average time from us hitting the door at Eisenhower to the time they go in the cath lab is 53 minutes. And time is muscle. The less time the, that they spend in the ER and in the ambulance means the more their heart that's safe so that they don't die and that their quality of life continues as it was. Here's one of the other things. You know, um, in this valley and in this city specifically, 50% um, of the patients with um, active heart attacks come into the ER uh, via ambulance. Um, this, is, this next statistic here, 50% false positives, that means that um, we only have an 8% false positive. Um, and that's important because when we call the STEMI, that means money to that hospital, especially at night when they're calling all, those, all that staff back. We're at 8%. Uh, the system in LA County is currently at 32%. I'm very proud of that fact that, that our folks are very accurate. In addition to that, if you look at 92% of the time, we call the STEMI right. That's our paramedics calling the STEMI right. But we do send that EKG to the hospital, and we have backup from the nurses and doctors. So if our field medics miss it, 
um, the doctors and hospital catch it. We're at 92%. Most other systems are down in the 70s. So again, our paramedics do a very good job, not only with catching it, but without creating any false positives. And there they are in the cath lab working. So um, I did have uh, Cindy Olson. She is the director of the cath, uh, cardiac cath lab at Eisenhower scheduled to come in today, but unfortunately she had staff called off today. So she's in scrubs treating patients today, but she would have come up here and told you that we're just swell and that we have a great, uh, a great, um, <laughs> a great relationship with them. And it goes both ways. Uh, the feedback we get from the doctors and nurses maintains um, our high quality of care and, and our guys stay sharp and they care about this, this topic very much. And um, I can answer any questions. Dan, from the time you get a call till you get to a certain point in Rancho Mirage, what is your average time? Our average response time is four minutes, 92% of the time. And so from that, that's when it starts. And from that point, the clock is ticking and every minute is critical. Absolutely. And as soon as you get that call, uh, do you notify Eisenhower when you're alerted or when you get to the patient? When we get to the patient, because oftentimes, you know, the patient will call the 911 dispatcher and just say, I'm having chest pain or I don't feel right or, or any number of things, because heart attacks don't always manifest themselves with chest pain. Sometimes it can just be, I, I, I have bad indigestion today or I have arm pain or I actually had a patient one time who said their jaw hurt and then when we hooked them up to the EKG, it was, it was obvious that they were, had ST elevation. So, the, they can manifest any ways, and, and, and the person least qualified to diagnose whether they're having a heart attack or not is usually the person who's calling 911. So. Well, I know we get a tremendous amount of compliments on the job you do and how you have helped an awful lot of people here in the community. So well, we the, city, the, the city properly staffs its fire department, and we appreciate the support, undoubtedly, and, and the results are that, that you have a high level of care in this city. Great. Are there any other questions of Dan? Well, right, we thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you so much. for the presentation. All right, thank you. We now have an update on the very successful Harry Potter book release party, as well as the bike safety rodeo uh, by the library staff, Valentin Lort and Aaron. Valentin is the librarian, and Aaron Espinosa is our library operations director. Welcome. Thank you, and good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of city council, and city staff. On July 30th, the Ranch Mirage Public Library hosted a midnight release party for Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. With almost 250 reservations, the library had almost 200 attendees who visited the library that night. KMIR was able to capture the magic of the evening. It aired on the 11 o'clock and Sunday news. Here's the segment now. Which wizarding house do you belong to? Do you know what a muggle is? What is Hogwarts? If you can answer these questions, you're a Harry Potter fan. Years later, another book is being released, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. Right here in the Valley, the Rancho Mirage Public Library is hosting a release party. It started at 10 and will last after midnight. Hundreds registered to attend. They get to enjoy games, crafts, food. And when the clock strikes midnight, they will be selling 200 copies of the book. You're uh, I'm Slytherin. Oh, and I am Ravenclaw. 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 I just Slytherin because it's the only one I remembered. Oh, no, I literally was sorted. <laughs> it was amazing to see so many people waiting to enter through platform in 93 quarters and hearing the oohs and ahs as they enter the community room. The staff worked diligently and was able to transform the community room, as you saw, into Hogwarts Great Hall. All the decorations were made by staff and teen volunteers. We had face painting by Desert Dream Parties, a stilt walker named Too Tall Tom. He stood at nine feet tall and dressed up as a Hogwarts student and engaged with attendees. At the end of the evening, Too Tall Tom was voted into the Ravenclaw house, and Gryffindor and Hufflepuff tied for being the house of the night. The crafts were quite successful. Attendees were making wands, pet rocks, owl, <laughs> magnets, and watching the first Harry Potter movie in the background. And when the clock struck midnight, we raffled eight copies of the book and two additional copies for a silent costume party, or contest, I should say. It was fun, it was a fun-filled event, and many people enjoyed. 
the feedback and responses that have, we've been having is tremendous. Staff were excited to be there and participate in the evening events. And days after the programs, and still today, patrons wonder when the next Harry Potter party slash special event will be. I would like to introduce Aaron Espinoza, Library Operations Manager. He'll be speaking on behalf of the Bike Safety Rodeo. Hey. Excuse me, uh, Valentin, whose idea was it to do the Harry Potter program? It was a collaboration, so uh, we had Yvonne Reed and Mim Gottschalk, and we all came up with the idea together. Uh, in addition to the Harry Potter Min Midnight Release Party, on August 4th, in conjunction with the summer reading program, the Rancho Mirage, uh, Rancho Mirage Library hosted our very first bike rodeo. The bike rodeo was a partnership between the Desert Recreation District, local law enforcement, Rancho Mirage uh, police, along with Palm Desert police. The Rancho Mirage citizens on, and the, excuse me, the Rancho Mirage citizens on patrol. 44 people attended the event and it participated in helmet fitting, bike safety rules, an obstacle course, and a raffle. Desert Recreation District donated 20 bikes to the rodeo that were raffled at the end of the afternoon. Some kids were fitted with the new helmets and three won bike repair toolkits. The officers began the demonstration with proper hand signals for turning and stopping while riding a bike, as well as other general safety precautions as a, in such awareness for other uh, roads and sidewalks. Kids who did bring their bikes, in addition to the two uh, children who brought scooters, uh, they all navigated the obstacle course, first walking the course with their bicycle and scooters, and then just to become familiar with the arrangement. Uh, along with the course, there was arrows pointing where they should go. There were stop signs, officers at each juncture, and the children were advised what to do. Uh, one of our regular families for the summer reading program coming out of uh, Desert Hot Springs actually walked away with four bikes for each child. Um, it was a lively event and everyone had a good time and learned useful bic bicycle facts as long as they also got to see a police motorcycle up close. These programs were just two of the highlights from our 2016 rider, or, or special summer reading program. The library and staff is looking forward to many more exciting programs, including collaborating with the Desert uh, Recreation District and other community organizations. We'd like to thank the City Council for their continued support. Uh, I'd also like to introduce Bob Adir, the Assistant General Manager from the Desert Recreation District, who is vital to this, the success of this event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to, on behalf of the Recreation District, thank the City of Ranch Mirage, the Ranch Mirage Library, and their awesome, wonderful, innovative staff. It's a, a thrill to be able to partner together and to de deliver programs that benefit and positively impact um, the community, all the communities. So it's a thrill to work together. It was a great event. You have a wonderful, air-conditioned, gigantic room that the whole valley is envious of. So we hope to um, roll out um, several more programs in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's, it's another example that perpetuates the reputation of the Rancho Mirage Library as being stellar, uh, not just locally, but throughout the state, and probably the country. Uh, it's, it's just a tremendous accomplishment, and we are so extremely proud of it. And Library Director David Bryant, and, and your, the entire staff, so we thank you. The, uh, we now uh, have the uh, non-agenda public comment where the public has an opportunity to speak on issues that are not on the agenda for a maximum of three minutes per speaker. First, I'll call on is Derek Hay. Mayor Weil. Derek is not here yet, so he told me to speak on his behalf. I knew and you I've, weren't Derek. I've coordinated both uh, what we both wanted to say, so I'll go ahead and do that. Uh, members of the council, staff, visitors, welcome. And uh, I'm here today to announce that we have tentatively met an agreement with Oasis Ranch, the people who bought our golf course and all of that over there and destroyed it and uh, 
So we're anyway we're in a in a situation where <clears throat> we're able to start doing something with it. Um, we'll keep the city, of course, appraised as to what occurs as we go along, and our lawsuit against them will stay on the Superior Court docket during the time of this agreement, settlement agreement, to make sure unless they default on any aspects of it, and then we can go back to our lawsuit and use that against them. And I wanted to alert the city to make sure that your liens that have been put against that place uh, for fence removal and all of the outstanding violations and any other relative costs that could have happened that your liens are up to date and on there so that the city is protected for all of the investment that it has made to help us over there. Um, our intention at this point is if we get control of that property and the deal goes through, we want to find a hotel operator to come in and tear down the clubhouse and to redo it and to follow pretty much in the line and concept of a a person by the name of uh, Tim Law, uh, Tim, I forget his last name, he's my neighbor too. Anyway, but he, uh, he came to the city with the idea of building a golf course, redoing the golf course and putting in a boutique high-end hotel with 100 rooms. It would have restaurant, bar, uh, pro shop and all of the amenities that go with it. So it, it would produce, if, if that would go through and we could find somebody to come and do that, we, uh, we know that it would produce some sales tax and the best kind of tax for the city of Rancho Mirage, tourist occupancy tax, because you don't share that with anybody else. So anyway, those are, that's what's on our goal. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do is, is we're going to get our hands on, the homeowners are going to get control of the perimeters. And they haven't, they don't own them, but they have, they want to have control of them so that they can arrange to change all of the landscaping, remove those ugly empty ponds that are out there and do it all terraced and have it done in desert tolerant. And we would meet with your people in public works or whatever department to make sure that uh, we're doing everything in our, possibly that we can to make it really nice and uh, make it look good for us and also to make it good and be a positive thing for the city for a change from Rancho Mirage Country Club. And as you know, uh, at this time, that area that is the largest section, the whole section that uh, is across the street from us on Frank Sinatra and goes up Bob Hope, from Bob Hope to Monterey and from Frank Sinatra to Gerald Ford is is in the process of uh, working out what some kind of a program for over there which will involve homes that start at 1.3 million so we want to make sure that that they don't regard us as a slum on the frank sinatra side that we will border with them and uh, so we're we're really happy to you know if we can get this thing accomplished that way and um, we look forward to working with them or anybody else that we have to to, to make sure that, uh, that what we do is satisfactory for them. Um, basically, uh, what has happened over there for the last year and so forth, as you well know, has been liens and legal fighting and uh, these guys that, uh, that bought it, that call themselves Oasis Ranch, they have other communities in San Diego County and in Nevada and in Colorado, and uh, we're actually ahead of all of those, even though we're next to the last one they bought. But because of our intent and our hard work and getting good attorneys and the fact that we live in Rancho Mirage and we have a city that is so professionally run and dedicated to the welfare of its citizens, we know that that's the reason that we are where we are with that thing. So again, one more time, we'd like, to, like you to know. Um, the other thing that I would bring to your attention is that um, all of your people from legal department to planning and zoning code enforcement, all of those departments, all those people have been on the same page and everything has been kind of back and forth and in agreement with them and they have done a really good job. And at the end of this thing, what I would like to say is 
the name Sandra Johnson. Uh, let me just use adjectives for her. Outstanding, capable, knowledgeable, able to accomplish with success all that she did in conjunction with the general plan, the specific plan, and chapter 14 of the city code. Um, she has been our bright light over there, and uh, the city is fortunate to have a code enforcement department with that kind of quality, and, uh, and besides that, she looks tough when she shows up on the, on the scene, you know, nobody gives her any gruff, because, but anyway, so I just wanted to let you know, and um, I guess uh, you can tear up Derek's thing, because he, uh, he didn't get, seem to get here in time, he's repairing his son's wheelchair, and, uh, and uh, so anyway, but I, I've got a couple of the things that he said in here, so do you, if there's any comments or questions from anyone, let me know, I'll, be tr I'll try to answer them for you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank All right, you, Stan. thanks. Jane, Dana? <clears throat> I'd just like to deal with uh, one point that Mr. Levinson said that uh, uh, <clears throat> is probably not correct about. He indicated that he <clears throat> somehow thought or learned that across the street in Section 31, mm -hmm. in Section 31, that there were... Um, uh, some type of a housing project with homes starting at 1.3 million contemplated. I just like to say that uh, there is no such thing, uh, Stan. There, there is no program. There is no developer that's come in with something like that. The city has approved absolutely nothing along those lines. You no, know, please stay there. I'm not going to. Well, I just wanted to let you know. No, we had a it's okay. You can have your meeting. I just want to make that fact clear, so, so that. <clears throat> well, that's better than my mother-in-law, but that doesn't work either. Uh, at any rate, uh, that's just not a fact. So I wanted you to know that so we don't all go forward thinking the Section 31 is now a stone's throw away from being developed. Thank you. Richard? Ted, would you like to ask Sandra Johnson to stand up? Certainly. Stand up, Sandra. She doesn't look tough, but boy, she is. <laughs> okay. The, uh, the next uh, speaker will Bill, be uh, Bill Reeson. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Wild, council members, city staff. Uh, you all know me as the uh, commissioner on the uh, Palm Springs International Airport Commission, representing the city of uh, Rancho Mirage. And, and uh, first of all, I just want to thank you again for allowing me to represent you and the city on the commission. It's been a wonderful experience for me this last uh, year and a half or so. Anyway, just to give you a, an, a brief update on what's going on at the airport, uh, there's <clears throat> there's uh, a couple of uh, major projects coming up. One, uh, which you'll be able to see in person when you visit the airport next summer, will start uh, the, the uh, reconstruction of the ticketing uh, annex. Uh, if, uh, if you've been to the airport during rush hour, the ticketing area where the uh, where you check in and check your baggage it can can be very busy and crowded. So the plan is to move those counters back about uh, 15, 18 feet back into where the the airlines uh, uh, offices are right now. Those offices will be relocated to a new building which will be built behind that uh, uh, that part of the terminal to house the uh, the airport uh, air, or the airline offices. So you can look for that to start uh, summer of next year. We don't want to do it during the season when it's so crowded. So next summer that project will get underway. Another uh, another issue, uh, the very well, how can I say? It? It's uh, 
complicated. The city of Palm Springs uh, has been, has requested to allow TNCs, or transportation network carriers, uh, uh, Uber, Lyft, those outfits to, to operate at the airport. Currently, they can drop off, but they're not allowed to, uh, to uh, pick up passengers. Uh, and so the Palm Springs City Council is trying to decide how to handle that situation, making the, the requirements for the Uber drivers comparable to the taxi drivers. Uh, and in, in the city of Palm Springs, the taxi drivers have, or the taxi companies, have quite stringent regulations that uh, Uber may not be able to, uh, or does not uh, 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 do now. So that's up in the air. We'll, we'll see what happens, uh, what the uh, Palm Springs City Council does uh, in the future. Uh, another interesting point, we found out lately that uh, Air Canada, which services uh, uh, Canada from Palm Springs Airport, is going to add a Boeing 767 to their fleet flying into Palm Springs. That's a 289 passenger airplane and uh, uh, it'll be the largest commercial airline airplane to operate in into Palm Springs in the airport history. So that's pretty exciting, big airplane like that coming in. And it's going to uh, uh, go to uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, Washington. Uh, the other thing uh, I want to point out is uh, the Air Museum on the east side of the airport. It's not part of the airport itself, but it's on, on the airport. They are currently starting to construct a new 20,000 square foot hangar at the uh, Air Museum. And it will be devoted to uh, the Korean, uh, Vietnam, Co uh, Cold War type uh, aircraft, uh, mainly the, the early jet fighter type aircraft. So that should be completed uh, hopefully by the end of the year or early next year. The, uh, the airport continues to just uh, update things as we go. A lot of the things that, uh, that the public does not see uh, are going on behind the scenes to, uh, to make uh, the airport safer, more efficient, more passenger comfortable. Uh, so anyway, uh, oh, one other thing. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Tom Nolan, the executive director of the airport, asked me to extend his appreciation for you, the city council, and the city of M M Rancho Mirage for, for supporting the airport. So that concludes my report. If you have any questions, I'd be willing to... Uh, yeah. I do, Bill. Yes. Isn't the issue with the... What did you say? Uber? I Uber. Say Uber. Yeah, it's Isn't been in the, the newspapers the, early drives recently. Me nuts trying to say that. <laughs> Isn't the staging area the big issue? That is one of the big issues. At, uh, at the last uh, commission meeting, which was over a month ago, because we were dark during August, we, we talked about uh, staging them away from the taxi. If you recall, the taxi lanes are right in front of the terminal uh, on the other aisle. And, <clears throat> excuse me. So, we were suggesting uh, that they be staged out away toward where the cell phone lot is now. But again, it's up to the Palm Springs City Council to make those determinations and, uh, and approvals. If I could add to that issue, one of the issues uh, of most significance with respect to Uber uh, is the fact that uh, Uber is regulated under state law by the Public Utilities Correct. Commission. Yes. And the Public Utilities Commission has no expertise in this field or probably many other fields other than the gas and electric stuff that they've been doing for a long time. Uh, taxi cabs in, in the valley at one time 
there were probably twenty five or thirty different companies some of mom and pop of one car one one cab and some of them two or three some years ago the cities of the valley who were sunline members formed an organization called the sunline transit authority i think or something close to that yes and um part of the responsibilities of that was to have a taxi uh, subcommittee uh, that uh, managed the affairs of the taxi cabs. Eventually, the taxi cabs got reduced down to about four or five uh, different entities competing against each other. Uh, they all are regulated through Sunline. They, the drivers all have to pass certain tests. They have to have, uh, be able to withstand background checks uh, of some significance. Uh, they um, have um, uh, have to have their vehicles inspected regularly by the uh, Sunline t Transit uh, Group, and um, Uber does not. Uber has none of that, or virtually none of that. Nobody regulating the drivers, checking on them, men seeing that uh, this requirement or that requirement is met with them. And uh, what it's doing is it's having a very serious and negative impact on the taxi industry that uh, we called from 30 or so companies down to five or so. And um, uh, Sunline, most everybody on the Sunline uh, committee uh, has uh, pretty much adopted the attitude that uh, uh, unless Uber drivers and Uber vehicles have to meet the strenuous requirements that uh, are imposed on the others, that uh, there's very little support on the Sunline board for the Uber uh, vehicles having access to particularly the primest of all prime locations, and that is airport pickups. Um, so I just wanted to balance this Uber stuff uh, a little bit with uh, the, the real problems that we have in this city, and I would hate like heck to see the Uber concept uh, destroy the taxi brands that we've got here, Yellow Cab and American Cab and others. So um, uh, right now I know that the uh, Palm Springs uh, City Council uh, is weighing those kinds of conflicting issues, and uh, they also have representation on the Sunline Board. So anyway, that's just an, an addendum to your uh, reference to the Uber situation. I thought I'd bring it to the public's attention. Yes, thank you, Mr. Overs. What you said is exa exactly true, and that is the big issue, is trying to get parity between these uh, uh, N TN TNCs, they're called, and the taxi cab uh, industry. And that's what the city of Palm Springs City Council is, is trying to uh, uh, find an answer to. There have I don't been, know where it's going to go. We know. There have been several attempts by cities and counties throughout the state to get the Public Utilities Commission, which really doesn't care much uh, about the individual down on the ground problems, to uh, relegate uh, Uber to uh, the supervision of other groups like the one we have here in uh, Coachella Valley. Uh, the Public Utilities Commission has turned a blind eye to uh, the issues that have been raised by the taxi industry. And uh, I don't know why they wouldn't say, sure, let them all compete on, an, on a level playing field, but they don't. I do know that Uber has billions in assets, at least I read that. And um, who knows if that plays any role in this, but we do know that uh, uh, the local taxi cab industry is being severely threatened by uh, the Uber industry. You are absolutely correct. And it's going to be interesting to see what the outcome is yeah. uh, eventually. Another question? Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you. <clears throat> the next speaker is Michael Harrington. Well, good afternoon. So my name is Michael Harrington, and I live in Rapture Mirage, as you know. 
And um, so the last time we were here, uh, myself and, and by my surprise, another uh, resident spoke about um, more police. And um, I know that resident went on a, went on a ride along. Um, I also went on a ride along some months ago. I just didn't share it with a lot of people, but just to share a little bit, you know, I, I was so impressed and I would also echo what the other resident said. I, I don't know her, never met her, but she encouraged others to go on ride alongs. Um, they have a lot of people out on ride alongs all the time. And maybe one of you can uh, put on a baseball cap and sunglasses or something and jump in incognito and don't tell them, but you'll be so impressed with the quality uh, of the people and seeing everything that goes on behind the scenes 24 hours a day. You know, everything that they're doing and how they work together, the logistics, all of the support people. You know, um, I got to see where they have dispatch in the, in the jail, and I saw a lot. And I, I spent seven hours, um, went along with them. So I think I got home about midnight. Um, but I wanted to say that I know we're at Mirage, you know, I know everyone's facing the budget and, and the increase in public safety. Um, I rode along with someone who had a master's degree and he's a deputy out here. And the quality of the people is just um, outstanding. And I, I think you should spend some time and see all of the people that work for the sheriffs and all of the programs they do. A few minutes ago, we we're talking about bike safety. And then they have, home, they have a new program for homeless. And they just have an array of all kinds of programs, all kinds of employees, good quality people. So to me, a, a pay raise, I mean, I would be glad to pay it. And I think uh, nationally, it's harder to get people to be police now. And um, we're facing attrition, I understand, people leaving. And uh, these are good people. We need them. They're special people. If you think of us, we might get upset if someone takes our parking space or we think they cut us off. And you know, everything they have to deal with, that takes a certain kind of person to do it um, and stay calm and uh, even-tempered, as everyone I saw was, so professional. Um, now, the last thing I wanted to say um, in addition to saying, please hire back the deputy that was cut, um, is that there was an article that came out in the Desert Sun, and it was on some other news channels. It said that a website called Value Pe Penguin took 2014 crime statistics, and this is just reported uh, August 25th, and it used property and crimes against persons combined and looked at population, because sometimes we hear a lot in the news about crime in Coachella, but they have 43,000 residents or more. We have about 20,000. This looked at property crime, uh, crimes against persons, as I said, and population. And it said that Cathedral City is safer than Rancho Mirage, and it put Rancho Mirage and Coachella almost even. And when you think about property crime, who's doing it? So I think we probably have more property crime. We don't, I don't think we have the, the Rancho Mirage uh, boys hanging out or some some street gang called the Rancho Mirage uh, uh, Rifa or something. I know we don't have gangs here, but who's coming to do the crime? And are they armed? Are they dangerous? Are they on drugs? So we have to think about that. Uh, a community service officer is not an armed officer. They're really a support person. So I know we hired a, a CSO and, uh, to, instead of a deputy, I would say keep the CSO. We needed one. That was the feeling I got when I did the ride along. But we also need that deputy. Um, and to me, to have Rancho Mirage and Coachella almost neck to neck on this survey, you could look at other surveys. Uh, these uses FBI crime statistics, and it said that Cathedral City is, is safer than us. I, we have five years reserves. Um, I would say, you know, get that deputy back. And also, let's support um, the police. And I think by, by, you know, paying them, and that also shows support, too. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is there anyone else? That Excuse me one second before uh, Mr. Harrington leaves. Can you give us the citation of uh, where, you got, where you got your statistics so that we can look at them? Yes. And uh, I assume you're not uh, campaigning anymore, that you're serious about this. So, yes. So uh, we want to look into that. We want to see the... I was serious the, last time, too. <laughs> the information. So just give us the citation okay. for, you, for your analysis that, that the, the number of crimes in... Uh, Coachella is equal to the number of crimes well, in Rancho Mirage, and that uh, it, people are safer in Cathedral City than they are in Rancho Mirage. Yes. So, so um, just give us the citation, just like you would to a judge in court. Sure. Since this I was, know you're an attorney. Sure. This was published in the Desert Sun, as well as a few other um, 
news sources. I pulled up KSEQ quicker. Just a citation, Va- not value, a news story. Just it's citation. called Value Penguin, and they used they based it on statistics with from FBI 2014. The reason it seems a little bit unusual, I think, is that um, not the unusual okay, part. Just give, me the stati- just give me the citation of the document or documents that you're referring um, to. California. Um, List of California cities, uh, FBI crime statistics compiled by a, a source called valuepenguin.com. Okay, thank um, you. you we, we've got that. We've yeah, got that. We'll I can send it to, to Thank Christy you very much. Too. Thank you. Is there anyone uh, else that uh, desires to make a public comment that did not fill out uh, a slip? Yes, sir. I did fill out a slip. Are you Mr. Hay? Yeah. Uh, he looks like we should up, call the uh, police, but why don't we let him speak? Yes. Yeah. He's our water district guy. Uh, absolutely. Am I out of work? Well, you soon will be, I'm sure of that. Um, that's par for the course, thank you. Patrick O'Dowd. Honorable Mayor, members of the council. My name is Patrick O'Dowd. I'm a resident of the city of Rancho Mirage, and I also have the privilege of serving on the Coachella Valley Water District Board representing Region 1, which is Rancho Mirage and Cathedral City. It's been some time since uh, I last visited these chambers, and I apologize for that. I intend to come more frequently and give you more of an update. There are a couple of things I wanted to bring your attention, so I stopped by today. I believe that the city is in receipt of a notice of a stakeholder group on the 7th of September regarding the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Uh, It's an outreach by the district to involve as many stakeholders as possible in a law which was passed by the state in 2014, which will ultimately move towards essentially a consolidated management of the entire aquifer within the Coachella Valley. I also wanted to to bring to your attention and and advocate for the city's uh, active participation as a stakeholder uh, in an upcoming study session regarding non-potable water supply. Uh, And in fact, I would like to see the city and all of the cities on the western half of the valley uh, represented at at, uh, many, if not all of the the, the districts function. The eastern half of the valley has had stakeholder representation in a number of different areas for some time, and their input has been instrumental in the decision-making process of the district. And the western half of the valley has not had that type of stakeholder input. The non-potable water supply study deals with uh, ostensibly the Mid-Valley Pipeline, which is being developed to address the uh, Mid-Valley urban overdraft. Uh, There's an area within the center of the valley, essentially from Palm Desert, uh, uh, La Quinta, uh, Indio, uh, Indian Wells, where where over the last 10 years, the groundwater levels have not risen. So so the, uh, the strategy that was developed by the district uh, in conjunction with bringing in water under the quantitative settlement agreement, the QSA, which is often talked about in conjunction with the uh, Salton Sea, uh, was to bring imported supplies and use them as a substitute for golf courses pumping water out of the aquifer in the western half of the valley. That project was originally uh, contemplated to be implemented by 2020, but right now the, the current timeline is looking at 2035, and I think that a part of that is a lack of stakeholder input from the uh, stakeholders in the western half of the valley. And I think that with a little more uh, attention drawn to that issue, uh, it can get the uh, respect that it needs. And those are the only two things I had. I appreciate the opportunity to visit. I'd be willing to answer any questions anybody might have. Well, thanks. We appreciate you coming here. Obviously, the CVWD is on all of our minds, particularly when we get our monthly bills. Thank you very much. And we appreciate you being here and bringing us up to date. I appreciate it. Thank you. If there is no one else desiring to speak, then I will close the uh, public comment period and go to the City Council board member comments. And I'll start with um, several. I'd like to congratulate the Ritz-Carlton Rancho Mirage for receiving Sunset Magazine's annual travel award for Best Desert Resort Hotel. 
The Ritz-Carlton beat out top-notch finalists in Arizona and, UNEC and Utah to take the award. According to Sunset's website, the awards are intended to honor excellence and innovation in the tourist industry. The awards recognize achievement in lodging, dining, cultural tourism, outdoor adventure, and other categories. Of the award, Sunset's deputy editor of travel stated, while judging this year's entrance with our panel of industry experts, we realized the winners reflected what people want out of a vacation experience right now. These days, traveling isn't simple about getting away, but about satisfying other needs like our stomachs and our souls. Well, I can tell you that the Ritz-Carlton Rancher Mirage certainly does both. And today, we have with us the General Manager, Kelly Stewart, and Director of Sales and Marketing, Anne-Marie Doyle. Please join me in congratulating them. And Kelly and Anne-Marie, would you please come up and say a few words? Good afternoon, Mayor Weil, ladies and gentlemen of City Council and City staff. On behalf of the ladies and gentlemen of the Ritz-Carlton Rancho Mirage, we are so graciously thankful for this thoughtful recognition. And I've brought our executive team and senior leadership team here to experience what a great relationship we have with you and the fact that you recognize us and, and we appreciate our rich partnership. We also are thrilled to be published in the Sunset Magazine, as we are on a global stage, aren't we, to really think about this gem and this oasis that we have, not only the Ritz-Carlton Rancho Mirage, but Rancho Mirage itself. So thank you very much for the recognition. Anne-Marie? Just thrilled to be here. I just would love to let you know that we're thriving. Um, business is great, and we look forward to 2017 being even better than 2016. Thank you for your support. W thank would you, you like to uh, acknowledge or introduce the members of your uh, staff that are here as well? I would be delighted to. If I may, ladies and gentlemen, feel please stand. We have Lou Rusticelli, who's our Director of Engineering. We have Shelley Myrie Lindo, who is our Director of our Spa. Come and have a spa treatment any, any time you'd like. We also have uh, Colin Maxwell, who is in charge of our marketing, and we're delighted to have him with us. And we have Cheryl Magdaleno, our Director of Human Resources. Our Director of not only rooms, but also our residents is Nicholas Hoffman. Our Director of Hotel Operations, Mr. Don Lenahan. And last but not least, our Director of Finance, Mr. Gary Ardry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly, very much. One other thing occurred last week that I would be remiss if I didn't bring it to everyone's attention, and that was Thursday afternoon. Again, marked a very special day at another one of our prideful resorts, uh, the Weston Mission Hills Golf Resort and Spa, that celebrated its 25th anniversary. The ceremony included the centuries-old Japanese tradition of breaking open a sake cask uh, called the Kagami Araki. And I can tell you I still have the sake on my hands from a splashing. Uh, the, the, the sake symbolizes the new beginnings and hope for the future to come. And by the way, the kimono, uh, Mr. Siddick, uh, attorney, you're going to have to advise me if I declare, have to declare that as a gift um, because they gave that to us. <laughs> Uh, the uh, participants in the ceremony were representing the Weston Golf Mission Hills. That's a uh, Randy Supan Supansky on the left, and, and the Vice President, Yugi Yagami, who was the, with the architectural firm that designed the hotel 25 years ago. Of the employees that were present, uh, 12 of the original 17 employees are still part of the Weston. They were all there. It was uh, exciting to have them and share that uh, happy occasion. The next day was really a spectacular event, and it was called the Yappy Hour. And this is 
in my opinion, one of the most sensational success stories that I know. The Weston initiated having a dog adoption program at the hotel. That's a picture of all the employees. And that particular dog, by the way, that's on the screen right now, was adopted at this event. Since the program started in 2015, 58 dogs have found a home as a result of being at the hotel and being taken care of in their lobby. Just a remarkable, remarkable statistic. The event was well attended, and many of the dogs were reunited with other dogs that had been adopted through this same program. I was pleased to meet a couple from Mission Viejo who returned to the resort after they had adopted a dog, and of course, as you can appreciate, the dog was named Weston. Uh, during my presentation, I will say this, that uh, uh, Dana Hobart and his wife joined us. Dana is really the person that uh, we identify with, uh, with the doggies, and he had an opportunity to come in and share and uh, participate. But it was just an incredible event. The electricity, the warmth uh, radiated throughout. And so I want to congratulate both of our fabulous resorts, uh, both the Ritz and the Weston, because they deserve all of the credit in the world. Uh, that concludes my comments. And uh, Charles, how do you have anything? Iris? I do have something. <clears throat> and uh, I actually, I have some very exciting news. It's a, uh, a great announcement for our residents of Rancho Mirage because it is with great pleasure that the Rancho Mirage Emergency Preparedness Commission invites you to a Map Your Neighborhood presentation on Tuesday, September 13th from 1.30 to approximately 3 o'clock right here in our chambers. Uh, the presentation will be led by Chairwoman Marcia Stein and former Emergency Preparedness Commissioner Claudia Fawcett. And let me just give you a little bit of information about this in detail because I have spoken about it before. And in fact, I did mention it um, after our last little shaker that took place in the desert here. Mapping Your Neighborhood was developed by the Washington State Military Department as an effective tool for improving disaster readiness at the neighborhood level because the person or persons most likely to help you during an emergency are not the police or the fire department, but rather your own neighbors. Most rescues are performed by neighbors, which is why it is essential that you know who your neighbors are and what capabilities they may have to help you. Uh, the Emergency Preparedness Commission has been working very diligently with our homeowner associations in Rancho Mirage to adopt this Mapping Your Neighborhood program. So wherever you live, this information can be very useful in helping you plan for any disaster. And I am particularly thrilled that we are going to be doing this because in the past, <coughs> most homeowner associations as a, their emergency program had what they called block captains, where each few blocks had one house with uh, a, hopefully a couple or a couple of single people that could participate as the block captains and coordinate whatever rescue activities might need to be taking place. The unfortunate thing about this is that most of the times these black block captains were not available. They were either out of town, they were away when um, occurrences might take place. So the program was devised so that the entire uh, community of possibly 20 homes or 18 homes or 15 homes, wherever uh, it, it is uh, most desirable, would get together, they would watch a video, the video would instruct them on how to coordinate rescues in their neighborhood. And they would find out what neighbors had disabilities, what neighbors had pets, 
and exactly what might be required to take care of each other if an episode took place. So, if you can, please put it on your calendar. It is September 13th, Tuesday, from 1.30 to approximately 3 o'clock. Please tell your friends and your neighbors to put it on their calendar and join us for this introductory session to mapping your neighborhood, to learning how you can help yourself and your neighbors during a disaster. Please contact someone at City Hall, preferably Britt Wilson, and respond to him that you will be attending and who else you know might be attending also so that we can keep uh, a, a list of uh, how many will be in attendance. We want to make sure that we have seating for everybody that will be attending, and we hope you will uh, take advantage of this wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much. The telephone number at Rancho Mirage City Hall is 760-324-4511, 324 4511 or please look on our website and you can get additional information. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. Richard? Ted, thank you. And um, welcome back, everybody. It's been a great summer. Hope you all had a nice, cool one. And uh, really looking forward to an exciting year in Ranch Mirage. Between now and next spring, we're going to have some outstanding events for you all to attend. And there's going to be a lot of information coming out about some of the special Rancho Mirage events. So it's good to have you back. Don't forget football, Rancho Mirage High School. Go, Ra go Rattlers! And uh, this is uh, their game tomorrow night uh, against Shadow Hills. Last week they began their, their season by defeating Beaumont 35-6. to It was a tough game, but they, they really uh, rolled over them and they're lo looking forward to run at the conference championship. Everybody says Rancho Mirage has a great team this year. They play Shadow Hills tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, here in Rancho Mirage. And then two of the big games following that are La Quinta and Palm Desert. So they're back into playing a lot of the major schools in the area. If you haven't been over to the field to see the new scoreboard, it is something that uh, is unlike anything else in, in high school scoreboards out there. It was, uh, I think it was $250,000, and it lights up the sky. So uh, it is uh, really something to see and enjoy. You'll enjoy seeing the Rattlers play. Uh, hopefully this year they'll have a better season than last. They were 9-3 and three last year, and they're looking for ever better things this year. So just remember, go Rattlers. Thank you, Richard. And we sure know that Richard is a, uh, a major, major cheerleader for the Rattlers. Thank you. Dana? Um, Iris, Jerry's last name is Argovitz. That $200,000 or so um, electric board that you referred to was donated by his wife by uh, Jerry Argovitz and his wife right. well, the two of them right. i guess uh, she i think is the gets the front billing on she that. was the driving force yeah. behind it so uh, that's, uh, that's and they live in Rancho Mirage yeah so that's a wonderful uh, great supporters of the school district as a whole yeah. and specifically Rancho Mirage High School um, th there's i wish i knew the name but i'm assuming that somebody here does Rancho Mars High School has a kickoff guy and a guy who kicks uh, field goals as well. He k does all of the kickoffs. You know, you kick from the 40, your own 40-yard line. The other side receives the ball somewhere between the 20-yard line and the back of the end zone. This fella has not had a run back all last year. In other words, his balls went either out, his kicks went out of the end zone, or they may have been caught in the end zone and touched down where the play begins on the 20-yard line. But not one single kick has failed to either go beyond the uh, area of the, um, uh, <clears throat> the ten, the, 
what is it, 15 or 20 yards, 20, yard. 20 yards uh, from the f first yard line to the back of the end zone. It's an amazing thing to see some young high school player do that. Nobody in college does that. But apparently he's a soccer kid. Right. He has background in soccer. And I can guarantee you that he'll be playing for the pros before too many years. Dana, at the Beaumont game, he tried a field goal for 64 yards and just missed it. And he, but he's been making that distance in practice and they had an opportunity for him to kick. And uh, it would have certainly been spectacular if he had made it. Hey, He'll really, make one before the end of the year, I'm really sure. Unique, uh, a really unique. Dana, uh, just to, to add on to that, uh, he is the son of the, the gal who so graciously appeared here from the Ritz-Carlton. Right. And she, her name is Anne-Marie Doyle, right. and that is her son. They are both from Ireland. And uh, we are so lucky to have him at our high school and have her at our Ritz-Carlton. Yeah. yeah, and his last name is Whalen, which was Anne Marie's what, maiden name or married name, I'm not sure. Former married name. So yes, Anne Marie was here uh, earlier with uh, Kelly. And wonderful, it, it's wonderful. exciting just to see him get out there and do the kickoffs, yeah, but uh, the field goals too, so. Somehow, Get out there early. Somehow I think his college uh, uh, admission is uh, already covered. Yeah. I sure hope it's SC. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you do. Uh, Dana, do you have any other uh, no, that's it. council well, Dana, comments? Well, Dana, maybe we'll put in a plug for USC for tomorrow mm -hmm. night. We're going to be at the game actually with Lonnie and Jerry Argovitz. Oh, yeah. So uh, yeah. we'll put in a good word for USC. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, that, um, that concludes uh, our council board comments. And uh, does anybody have any uh, additions or changes to the minutes of July 21st? If not, I'll ask for a motion for approval. You can't take the guard off. I'll make a motion. And a second? Second. Please vote. And the motion is approved five to zero. The next will be the consent calendar, Ryan, Randy Binder, our city manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council. A quick announcement before I get started on the brief uh, consent calendar. Uh, yesterday, August 31st, uh, Governor Brown signed AB 2228, Assembly Bill 2228, uh, that was co-sponsored by the League of California Cities and the California Association of Code Enforcement Officers. It's legislation that establishes the Code Enforcement Officer Standards uh, that uh, requires standards, standardization of testing for various classes of certified Code Enforcement Officers, and it promotes consistent training throughout the cities in California for Code Enforcement Officer safety. And uh, I just wanted to say that uh, our, co our senior code enforcement and building department manager, Sandra Johnson, uh, helped write those, um, um, those tests and helped push this forward and to help make it part of the state law. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We have something to celebrate at your CACEO conference in October. In beautiful downtown Rohnert Park, California. Nice. Mr. Mayor, uh, can we pull item number 11 from the agenda? That is the uh, uh, police substation award of contract uh, that would be built at the city library. Staff wishes to rethink that project. We think we can do it uh, much less expensively and uh, quicker time frame. So if we can pull item number 11, we'd appreciate it. Item number one is to waive full reading of all the items on the consent calendar. Item number two on consent is second reading of the ordinance that would uh, allow the opportunity for uh, gardening services to take classes in landscape and uh, water irrigation conservation efforts when they get a business license. Item number three on your consent calendar is a quarterly treasurer's report. This would be receiving and file the June 30th quarterly treasurer's report. And as you know, it's the city's policy to try to achieve a market rate of return on the public fund investments 
while minimizing the city's risks and preserving capital. This last quarter, it was a paltry 0.79%, but it preserves, um, it preserves capital and it does not uh, have uh, risks to the city. Item number four on your consent calendar are the approval of the contracts. There are one um, contract, I'm sorry, that's item number five. Item number four is appointment of uh, Mr. Jamie Kabler to fill a vacancy on the Ranch Marsh Public Library Foundation Board. This was uh, Council Member Hobart's nomination and his application is on file in the City Clerk's Office for your inspection. Item number five are approval of contracts and item number six are demands. We're here to answer any questions. Thank you. Council have any questions regarding the consent calendar? If none, I will ask for a motion please. I'll Move make we motion. approve consent calendar. And a second. A second. Please vote. And the motion is approved five to zero. The next is a uh, uh, report on the CV Link update by Council Member Hobart. You may recall last at our last. You may recall at our last meeting, uh, I referenced the fact that CVAG had finally reached that point where they have placed the uh, CV link in a position to be eligible under their interpretation of the law, to be eligible for uh, Measure A funds, the measure that was passed by all the voters of Riverside County back in 2002 uh, for the repair of our uh, broken roadway uh, situation across the uh, entire county. <clears throat> well, since then, uh, Indian Wells has decided that they were going to put on the ballot a measure similar to the one that we had in Rancho Mirage, saying that CV Link could not go down uh, any area within the city of uh, Indian Wells without first securing a vote of the public in favor of such a project. In other words, taking it out of the hands of uh, the council members uh, that change rather routinely. And uh, uh, so rather than have three votes, only takes three to pass anything, as you know, in the council. So rather than being concerned about sometime in the future, three votes could change that rule of uh, not allowing uh, CV Link in the Valley, they, um, they placed on this coming November ballot a measure that if it passes, it will then mean that for CVAG to be able to run CV Link down some street or near their golf course or wherever, uh, that uh, they will have to have a vote of the public, just like Rancho Mirage did. Well, needless to say, that didn't meet with uh, pleasure by some members of CVAG. Uh, that, and one of them, one of these people caused uh, a measure to be placed on the Transportation Committee this past August 29th, just a couple days ago. Uh, and the subject was request to discuss the legality of using Major A road funds for sound walls at Indian Wells Golf Resort and on the city's beautification of Highway 111. <clears throat> what this is all about is former mayor of uh, Palm Desert, Jan Harnick, uh, wrote a letter and insisted that this be on the agenda, the CVAG agenda for the uh, Transportation Committee and to go to other committees, I presume, later. <clears throat> there was a staff report, an official CVAG staff report, pushing this matter forward. <clears throat> Jan Harnick is not the only person connected with uh, CVAG that was disappointed uh, that uh, a city dared to challenge the authority of CVAG and say, we don't want CV Link coming down uh, our cities without us first having citizen approval. So she wrote, wrote, or somebody wrote, this background 
It says, Mayor Pro Tem Harnick's request, and I'm only going to read a few paragraphs from this report, but it's all online. You could see it online if you go to the uh, CVAG uh, website. On June 27th, Mayor uh, Palm Desert Mayor Pro Tem Jan Harnick delivered a letter to the CVAG Executive Committee asking for discussion and potential action on the following item. Legality of using Measure A and road funds for sound walls at Indian Wells Golf Resort uh, for the city's beautification of Highway 111. <clears throat> About 10 years ago, right around $3 million was approved by CVAG, the executive committee, Tom Kirk, uh, <clears throat> that for their project that they were doing in Indian Wells, uh, having to do with the widening of Highway 111, it included also walls that were designated as sound barriers. Uh, so apparently they're being referred to as beautification. Uh, they were approved as uh, sound barriers back, uh, you know, in 10 years ago. Now because they're angry at uh, Indian Wells for daring to put a measure on the ballot for public vote, now they're making this effort to, to have Indian Wells repay that $3 million, claiming, well, it should never have been approved in the first place, and uh, uh, you should um, uh, expect, us, you expect to repay it to, uh, to CVAG. Uh, that's what happens when you're not on the good side of the CVAG leadership. It, part of her letter goes on as follows. Over the last year, as Ranch Mirage Mayor Councilman Hobart began and continues sending the CVAG uh, Executive Committee and others across the valley email after email on the intent of Measure A, I couldn't remain on the sidelines after Indian Wells then Mayor Ty Peabody sent a letter to CVAG and then stated at an Executive Committee meeting about how Indian Wells residents believe that Measure A funds should never be used except to repair defective, debilitated roadways, bridges, and intersections. Dot, dot, dot. I am hereby requesting an update on this Indian Wells golf course and Highway 111 project uh, from CVAG. Uh, <clears throat> from CVAG. So anyways, they, they, op they opened the issue of um, re or requiring uh, Indian Wells to repay that $3 million. Part of the analysis goes as follows. <clears throat> uh, in the agreement with CVAG, it states the city, quote, indicated that preliminary results for the environmental study of widening Highway 111 are required to mitigate noise for the project. Since that analysis is not found in any environmental document approved by the council, CVAG has worked with the city to locate any such results. As of the latest correspondence, CVAG has not received any information to show sound walls at the golf re uh, resort were required in mitigation. So uh, I just wanted to show the retaliatory arm of CVAG if you go against them, uh, they're going to come after you one way or another. And uh, this is just an example that 11 people, 11 votes, 11 to 2, voted to put this in position to take Measure A funds. And guess who the two were that voted no? Oh, you're right. Rancho Mirage and Indian Wells uh, voted so that um, Measure A funds could not be used for CV Link. Anyway, just wanted to bring you that little update as to the politics that are going on behind the scenes on that issue. And the agreement that they're talking about is 10 years old. So they want to go back 10 years to try to claw back 3 million and uh, it'll take them, I'm sure, some time to find documents assuming that they're retained that long. Anyway, just a heads up. Thank you, Dana. It certainly was an interesting meeting, as you know. And uh, we have taken a position of objecting. And uh, 
and that was sent to all members of the uh, CVAG uh, Transportation Committee, as well as the chairman of the uh, CVAG Executive Committee. Next item is, uh, is the contract award for roof construction services at Parkview Villas. Marcus Alleman, our management analyst. Marcus. Good afternoon, Honorable Chair, members of the Housing Authority Board, and city staff. I'm here to recommend the award of contract for roof construction services to roof asset management in the amount of $182,320. The award of contract will allow the Housing Authority to complete the roofing project set forth in late 2014. The initial phase of the project repaired the roofs of all residential units and the clubhouse at Parkview Villas. The second and final phase of the project will repair the roofs of the carports and garages. Before moving forward with the second and final phase, the Housing Authority determined it would be beneficial to analyze the cost with availability of ROPS money. However, the substandard conditions of the carport and garage roofs prompted the Housing Authority to move forward with the project and recommend funding through the Housing Reserve Fund. If you would please look at the screen, you'll see a few photos of the current conditions of the carports and garages. At the slide you're looking at right now is slide number one. You'll see the wind damage, <laughs> the effects of wind damage to the metal roof edge which protects the edge of the roof sheeting. Slide number two. The missing metal roof edge has caused the roof covering to fail and expose the roof decking. Then if it gets wet, it starts to um, absorb a lot of that water. Then the final slide shows the damage water migration can cause to the roof sheeting. The piece of plywood was set there to deter any further damage. Staff posted a request for proposal for roof construction services, but no, submittals, no proposals were submitted. Having received no proposals, staff reached out to Willie's Construction Corporation, who completed the initial phase of the project. After receiving verbal notification that they would submit a proposal, one was not received. Ultimately, staff was able to obtain proposals from two other roofing companies, Castro Roofing and Roof Asset Management, with Roof Asset Management being the low bidder. Staff presented the proposed project to the housing subcommittee consisting of Mayor Weil and Councilman, or Council Member Kite to address any questions or concerns and to convey the importance of, the pro of this project being completed. With their approval, Staff is recommending award to contract of contract to roof asset management. Thank you for your time. I am available to answer any questions. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, are there any uh, questions that council members might have? Iris? I do have two questions. Um, number one, I note on page 8-7, number six, um, damaged plywood will be replaced at the rate of $60 per sheet or portion thereof and build separately as a change order. Do we have any idea how many of these uh, panels will need to be replaced? We do not. It would be something that would be determined as the work's going along because they have to get inside the actual structure to know which plywood is um, that you would be able to still use or would have to be replaced. Okay, and the other thing, number seven, um, no beam replacement is included in the contract amount. Um, could you explain a little bit about what the beams are? Yeah. Um, if I might, the uh, beams actually support the carport structures and um, the condition of which is fairly unknown until they actually remove the roof structure of those. And once they remove those, they can provide to us a list of beams that need to be replaced. But that cost was not built into this proposal or this project because we needed to move forward with actually getting the roofs repaired right away. Okay. So that would come as a separate project if it's determined that that's a significant cost. Okay, great. Thank you. So then there are two separate projects over and above this amount of money, right? 
Not necessarily. It just really depends on what they find once they remove the roof structures. I don't know that that cost would be significant, and it's not something that we can know until they actually begin the work. Thank you. Are there any other questions? If there are no others, may I hear a motion, please? I will make a motion. Second. Richard, do you want to make it? Sure. Go right Charlie, ahead. go ahead. I will do it. I'll make a motion that the Housing Authority Board approve the award and contract to Roof Assistant Management in the amount of 182320 for the completion of carport and garage roof repairs at Parkway Villas. Thank you, Charles, and I think I heard a premature second. Um, it was a premature second. <laughs> uh, we now have a uh, mature second. then second. Uh, please vote. And the motion is approved five to zero. The next item will be uh, an award of contract for the annual landscape maintenance services. Uh, Joseph Carpenter, our senior management analyst, will present it. Joseph. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Honorable Chair, members of the Housing Authority Board, before you today is a request to award a contract to Mariposa Landscapes Incorporated in the amount of $209,028. The request for proposals, or RFP, for annual landscape maintenance services at Parkview Villas, San Jacinto Villas, Santa Rosa Villas, and Whispering Waters was posted on the city's website on July 14, 2016, with a submission deadline of August 3rd. Staff received six proposals. However, only two contractors scheduled and conducted on-site inspections of the properties to examine the sites and acquaint themselves with the working conditions as required in the RFP. Staff reviewed and evaluated the proposals based upon the evaluation criteria established in the RFP, including, among other qualifications, proposal cost, proposed labor hours and supervision, qualifications of personnel, after hours emergency availability, and past performance. Staff also met with the housing subcommittee, consisting of Mayor Weil and Councilmember Kite, to discuss the results of the RFP and address questions raised by the subcommittee. After staff review and consultation with the subcommittee, it was determined that Mariposa Landscapes was the lowest responsible bidder. Therefore, staff recommends with the support of the Housing Subcommittee that the Housing Authority Board award the contract for annual landscape maintenance services to Mariposa Landscapes. I would like to thank Mayor Weil and Councilmember Kite for their time and input this past month while staff moved this project forward and thank the board for their consideration this afternoon. This concludes my report. I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you, Joseph. Does council have, yes, Richard. Um, Joseph, you did a great job on this report. The question I think we've discussed previously is how many full-time uh, landscapers do we have on each site on a daily basis? And then can you give me how often the full crew comes around and takes care of the landscaping? Each property will have one full-time landscaper assigned to them with the exception of Whispering Waters. It's a smaller property, and so it'll have a part-time person there. And then in addition to that, Mariposa will have a work crew of three to four people that moves through the properties to do all of the mowing and the trimming. Okay, and how often would that take place? The mowing will take place once a week, and the trimming will happen minimum quarterly, but on an as-need basis as the Housing Authority deems to the contractor. Okay. Thank you. I think this, uh, this new landscaping program will certainly upgrade the quality of landscaping that we have at the various properties. We're going to have more hands-on uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and then the crew coming back in on a regular basis doing the major work. So uh, hopefully this group will work out better than the last. Are there any other questions? Can I just make, a, yes. can I just make a, uh, an observation? There's something about this that is, seems like it would really be interesting to the public at large. <clears throat> there were six companies that um, bid on this annual landscape maintenance services contract. 
between the two lowest, there was only an $800 difference. One was for $209,028, the other was from $209,820. Obviously, the lowest bidder got it. The highest bidder in that group of six was 344000 So you can see there's a major difference. And it's just kind of interesting to see these numbers to show the importance of securing uh, competitive bids for most major, uh, measurable uh, and expensive projects that we're doing in the city. It's just kind of an interesting thing, though. $800 difference to the lowest, and the lowest and the highest were $134,000 apart. Actually, out of those six bids, five were within a small number of dollars, and that one bid was 100000 out of line. Right. So, so we got pretty good bids, uh, but it's, it's uh, good to look at these sometimes and see the spread and see what happens when you have an open bid like that. I think I the you other guys aspect, did a great job. Yeah, the other aspect uh, that was presented to the subcommittee was checking out the quality of the work of those that were bidding. In other words, it wasn't just taking a look at the amount, taking a look at the differential and the price, but actually checking checking their work, taking a look that uh, uh, that it was satisfactory and, the, and it would work for our development. So it's not just a dollars and cents uh, exercise. So I give Joseph uh, and whoever a lot of credit for going to that extent. Um, that being said, may I uh, have Mr. a motion Mayor. regarding the uh, landscaping? Okay, Mr. Mayor, before you, we go on for the vote, I just wanted to also commend both uh, Sean Smith and uh, Joseph, and also Marcus for doing his, a wonderful job on his first uh, report up here on the dais. Um, I know it isn't easy sometime, but you all do a wonderful job in working with you as I have in the past on certain projects. I know how competent you all are, and thank you so much. Okay. Thank and you I very much for that. And I will go ahead and make the motion, if that's okay. Please do. Okay, I move that the Housing Authority Board approve the award of contract to roof asset struck, strike that. I'm back on the other one. Okay, go back to uh, item number nine, and I move that the Housing Authority Board award the annual landscape maintenance services contract for Parkview Villas, San Jacinto Villas, Santa Rosa Villas, and Whispering Waters in the amount of 209000 $28 to Mariposa Landscapes Incorporated. I'll second that. There's a motion and a second. Please vote. <clears throat> Councilmember Hobart. The and the motion is approved 5 to 0. The uh, Next item will be presented by Mark Sambito, our Director of Public Works, regarding the award of contract for painting of traffic signal poles and equipment. Uh, Mark, if you would, please. Thank you, uh, Honorable Mayor, members of the Council. The item before you this afternoon is a request to uh, award a contract to Kais Custom Painting for the purpose of painting several of the intersections, traffic signal poles, and control cabinets. Uh, as part of the Public Works maintenance effort, we will regularly paint some of the traffic signal poles and the cabinetry uh, in order to uh, ensure the, the good maintenance of these facilities. Uh, it, due to the harsh desert environment, uh, at some point it becomes uh, you know, unable to be cleaned and actually needs to be stripped down and repainted. So we went out uh, with a RFP in order to get some companies to propose on this. And unfortunately, we received no bids. So Public Works reached out to some other local painting contractors in the area and had asked three of them to give us a proposal. As you can see, uh, Keist Custom Painting was the lowest responsible and responsive bidder in the amount of $38,850. This is, uh, the funding for this is within the approved 2016-17 budget as a regular maintenance item. 
and I would appreciate your consideration on this. It does not include any contingencies, and uh, I am available uh, for questions as the end of my report. Thank you. This Thank you, is part of their um, expertise in painting these poles in other cities? We have very clear specifications as to our painting requirements and the material that we use, and uh, we feel very comfortable that the company will be able to, to meet all those requirements. Thank you. Nothing uh, exceptionally unique. It's just a commercial grade painting project. Good. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Mark, what was the amount budgeted for this? Uh, $38,850 and no contingencies. Was, was that the amount that we had in our budget? <laughs> Uh, it was rolled into uh, overall annual traffic signal maintenance, so it's well within our budget. Okay, thank you. If there are no other questions, I will ask for a motion, please. I move that the City Council award contract for traffic signal pole and equipment painting to the lowest responsible and responsive bidder, KEIST, that's K-I-E-S-T. Oh, sure. <laughs> custom <laughs> painting in the amount of $38,850. Second. I read in spite of the interruption. Uh, please vote. And the motion is approved 5 to 0. The next item has been removed from the agenda and we'll go to uh, the uh, Isaiah Hagerman regarding the approve of the Fourth Amendment to the Sunline Joint Powers. Isaiah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, the item before you today is a request from the Sunline Transit Agency. They are recommending approval of the Fourth Amendment to the JPA agreement. Uh, in May 1977, the incorporated cities of the Coachella Valley and the county joined together in this agreement to create Sunline Transit Agency. Uh, Councilmember Hobart is the representative for our city on this board. And what this amendment does is it amends the, the agreement to change board member compensation for attendance at meetings. And at the end of the day, uh, board members are eligible for $100 at this point based on going to three meetings. Uh, this change would increase that by $50, so it would increase the compensation to a total of $150 for a month's worth of meetings. Attached to the staff report are a copy of the Fourth Amendment to the JPA agreement on page 12-4, and attachment B to the staff report is the request letter from Sunline Transit Agency on 12-12. And attachment C to the staff report on page 12-14 is the staff report when Sunline Transit Agency presented this item to their board. There is no fiscal impact on the city of Rancho Mirage, and the fiscal impact on Sunline Transit Agency is discussed in the Sunline staff report on page 12-4. I'd be happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> Can I make a comment, Thank you. please? I say, uh, Dana? <clears throat> yes. Um, <clears throat> The Sunline uh, Transit Agency was um, uh, given the opportunity of voting whether we should increase the um, payment per me per. I was going to say per meeting, but it's not per meeting. We there are two or three subcommittees that meet at the same time uh, prior to the executive committee uh, or board committee the board itself of Sunline Transit Agency uh, meeting. <clears throat> this matter was presented to the, um, to the board and two cities voted, voted to oppose the, recommend the recommended uh, increase of payment or compensation to the uh, board members. Uh, the two cities that voted against it were uh, Rancho Mirage and La Quinta. Uh, we voted no, the rest voted yes. Um, <clears throat> I personally intend to vote no here today. Uh, our compensation uh, for attending those meetings uh, is adequate where it is, in my view. 
and um, others felt differently. The majority felt differently. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Any other questions? If, the, if there are no other questions, I will ask for a motion regarding this issue. I would recommend that the City Council not approve the Fourth Amendment to the Sunline Joint Powers Transportation Agency Agreement. And is there a second? Second. Please vote. So we're voting yes means yes we're opposed means to it. Yes means you're supporting to reject the request yes for an increase. No. Yes means no. Okay. And the motion is approved five to zero, which means that the request for a, an increase in the compensation has been denied by Rancho Mirage. Question I've got of our city manager, I mean of our city attorney, um, does that require, for Sunline to get that increase, is, does that require unanimity among all of the, uh, I, I'm not sure, is it a joint yeah, powers agreement? Yeah, that's, it's, that's a joint powers agreement. I'd have to look at that to see what. To see if it does, yeah. okay. We can check it out later, thank you. <clears throat> And that uh, we now would uh, ask our city attorney to uh, review the uh, issues for the closed session. Steve? Uh, Mr. Mayor, at this point, the city council and the housing authority board will recess into closed session to confer with legal counsel regarding two potential initiation of litigation items pursuant to government code section 54956.9. The council will also confer with legal counsel regarding existing litigation known as Veronica Juarez versus City of Rancho Mirage, pursuant to government code section 54956.9. Thank you very much, Steve. We will now recess to close session. <laughs>